walking in a field when all of a sudden they looked and a bull was charging towards them. They didn't know what to do and so they decided to hide behind a fence. When they were when they realized that the bull was chasing them in hot pursuit, they were like, oh my goodness, we don't know what to do. So Jim says to John, he says, John, say a prayer for us. And John says, but I've never prayed out loud before in my life. And, he's, and Jim says to him, but you have to, you have to. We're, something terrible is going to happen. And he said, okay, I'll pray the only prayer that I know. And it's the prayer that we said at Grace every night when we were growing up. Oh, Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. <laughs> so Thursday was Thanksgiving. We all gorged ourselves on turkey and stuffing. I gorged myself on too much stuffing because that's my favorite part of Thanksgiving. And no matter what, it is a day when we sit around the table with our family and our friends. It's a day when we are supposed to be thankful. It's called Thanksgiving. It's built into the name. We're supposed to be thankful. But I realize that for some people, and it's been the case for me some years, that there aren't always so many things for me to be thankful for. Sometimes it feels like on Thanksgiving when we're sitting around the table and we are supposed to be coming up with something that we're thankful for to share around the table. We're like, I don't have anything to be thankful for because I feel like there's a bull charging towards me in my life and I'm having trouble being thankful today. And I realized that there are people who are really struggling in their lives, whether it be with their marriage or with chronic illness or unemployment or dreading spending time with our families. There are some people who that Thanksgiving moment where you, you like build all this energy to spend time with your family ends up with a fight with your brother-in-law. This didn't happen to me. I'm just using this as an example. I didn't see my brother-in-law. Uh, but it ends up with a fight with your brother-in-law or that, that thing that's been building up with your sister that like you haven't been able to talk to that explodes all over the Thanksgiving table. Um, and sometimes Thanksgiving is very hard because of broken and tough relationships, because of things that other people have done, and because of the things that we have done. And for times, for some of us, there are times when it's difficult to think about what we can be thankful for on Thanksgiving. And I feel very blessed. I am very thankful for a lot of things in my life, for the people in my neighborhood, in my community, my friends, and um, the people in here at church and our family com church community here and my family and friends. Um, I have so much to be thankful for, but I know that not everyone does during those times. But even when we don't have things or we don't think that we have things to be thankful for, Thankfulness is not about what we have or what we don't have. Thankfulness is about being grateful for the life that we have been given and being willing to live another day by faith. Because just like faith, thankfulness is a choice. Choosing to be thankful and grateful is a choice because we realize every day that the life that we have, the faith that we have, the ability that we have to be in relationship with Jesus and getting to know Jesus better is something that we should be thankful for. And when we live this life of thankfulness, we realize that we end up having to be so, we have so much to be thankful for rather than so much to be bothered by. And it's that difference between that half-empty, half-full living, and thankfulness is a choice. So there was a man in Budapest who went to see his rabbi, and he complained. He said, oh, rabbi, my life is unbearable. I don't know what we're going to do. There are nine of us living in one room together. What can we do? And the rabbi said to him, go home and take your goat and bring him into the room with you so that there are nine of you and the goat living in one room together. And the man said, well, Rabbi, what are you talking about? There are already nine of us living in this room together. How can we bring a goat in the room? And he said, just do it and come back in a week. And a week later, he says to the goat, he says, not to the goat, he says to the rabbi, the man says to the rabbi, he says, oh, rabbi, well, we can't handle it anymore. There are nine of us in the room and now the goat, and he's so stinky and he's smelly and he goes to the bathroom everywhere. And it's just gross. And he eats everything. What are we going to do? And he says, go home and take the goat out of the room. And he goes home, and a week later, he comes back to the rabbi, and the man is just elated, and he says, oh, 
Life is so good. There are only nine of us in the room, and there's, only, and there's no goat. I know, two jokes in less than five minutes, Liz. Goodness gracious. Um, what is this? The, the, the heckle hour? No, but really, thankfulness is a matter of perspective. The man was thankful for not having a goat in his room, and he forgot that he didn't like having nine people in the room. It's a, thankfulness is about going into situations with like, oh, I, instead of going into situations saying, oh, I need this, I have to have this, I want this, and going in with the spirit of, oh, I think this is going to be okay. Oh, I'm going to see the positive in the midst of this. Sp spirit of thankfulness is choosing to live a life thanking God for the blessings that we have in our life, as opposed to doing, as opposed to saying, if I do these certain things and then I will expect something in return, a gift in return. But being thankful is being thankful despite the circumstances because our life circumstances aren't always going to be what we expect them to be. Our life circumstances aren't always going to be wine and roses, but we get the opportunity to choose thankfulness. So one day, Jesus was out walking. He was on the road to Jerusalem, and... As Luke tells us in our passage this morning, he is, go, is on the road to Jerusalem. This is the third time he's kind of on the road to Jerusalem during the, the gospel of Luke. And as he's going, Jesus comes across 10 people. And the 10 people he, come across, he comes across are 10 men who have leprosy. And this is what happens. This is from Luke's gospel, the 17th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse, if you want to grab that in your Bible this morning. So on the way, Luke tells us this story. He says, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated, him, prostrated himself at his feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten men made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So imagine, you are a person who is living on the outskirts of society. You're living on the road between Samaria and Galilee because you live in a society where if you are sick, you're stigmatized. Or if you have an illness that's on your skin, no one can touch you, no one can be near you, and if they do, those people have to go and be ritually cleaned in order to then continue on in their life. And in order to live this life having a skin ailment, you have to live outside of town, somewhere where other people who have the same skin ailment live. When one day you wa are walking along the road, uh, you see this man walking along the road. Now you've probably heard of this man before because living on the outskirts on, on a road somewhere, you probably hear people talking as they're walking, and you've probably heard about these miraculous things that this new guy, this Jesus, is doing in your midst. And so when you actually see Jesus, you and your other nine friends start to talk to one another, and you say, hey, what would it cost? Can we ask him? Can we really ask for this healing? Can we be bold? Knowing that we are on the outside of society, and he may say no to us, but let's do it. Let's ask. And he doesn't say no. Jesus says, now go. Go and tell the priests and confirm that you are well. And as they're running out of town to go tell the, running into town to go confirm that they are well, the one man, one of your friends, stops he runs back and he says, I'm going to go thank Jesus. I'm going to go thank this guy that healed us. I'm going to go thank 
the one that healed me because something has happened to me and I want to thank the one that did it. Now, Luke is very evident to point out that the one man who came back was not like the others. The one man who came back was a Samaritan. Now, if we know anything about Samaritans or we remember anything from the story of the Good Samaritan, that the Samaritans were on the outskirts of society. So not only was this man on the outskirts of society because he had leprosy, but he was on the outskirts of society because he was a Samaritan. He was, um, he was a half-breed. Um, and so the nine who left, they needed that confirmation from the priest. But the one who returned said, wait, I need to be thankful. Something has happened in the midst of me. Something has happened. Not only have I been healed physically, but something has been changed within my life spiritually as well. So look at this story. It wasn't the ones who were... It, it was someone from the outside. It took someone from the outside to acknowledge Jesus' work. Who were the ones who were not acknowledging Jesus' work? The ones who were on the inside. It took someone from the outside to see and to be thankful for what Jesus was doing in their midst. It took someone from the outside to see God's work in his life. And I think that that's sometimes what stops us from being truly thankful for the things that God gives us in our lives, is that we are on the inside <laughs> and that we have become so like sanitized to the work that God is doing that we forget to see what God is doing. We forget to be thankful for what is God is doing. We forget to stop and run back and say, Jesus, thank you for being a part of my life. Thank you for being in the midst of my life. And it took someone from the outside to see that gift, to see that healing that was taking place. But what if we were to live this spirit of thankfulness, to be thankful for God at work in our lives so that other people saw that thankfulness? What if we were to fully live into the gratefulness that we have been, that all, into the gratefulness that we have in being in relationship with Jesus Christ? What if other people saw that? Would they then be grateful for the way that God is working in the midst of their life as well? Because the healing that took place in that Samaritan's life caused a redirection. Because the healing that took place wasn't just about the physical healing, but it was a spiritual healing that took place. The Samaritan embraced the grace that God had given, the grace that Jesus had given him. He said, wait, I need to change the direction of my life and thank the one who gave me that gift. And to live a life of faith is to live a life of gratitude. To live a life where we are leaning into gratitude in our lives. Because practicing gratitude is practicing faith. Because gratitude is not about what we get out of it. It's not like when we open a present and we're super excited about what's in that gift and we're super grateful for what we get in that gift. Or you know how you open a gift and you like have to pretend that you're happy, it, but it's not really what you wanted? That's not, that's not what a life of gratitude is. A life of gratitude is a life where we are thankful and grateful for the good parts and the not so good parts, which is hard to live into. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be thankful for the, for the not so good parts, but a life of gratitude is finding God, finding grace in the middle of tough situations and realize, realizing that at the end of the day that God has promised to be at work in our lives. And we are called to be thankful even when things don't turn out the way we have planned, even when things don't go the way we want them to, even when we feel like we can't see the good. Because what happened to the Samaritan on that road when he turned back is that he was healed. 
And he was healed both physically and spiritually, and he, Jesus was at work in his life. See, the verb that, that he uses, that Jesus uses when he says, your faith has made you well, has made you well, is also translated sometimes as, your faith has saved you. So that there were 10 men who were, who were healed that day, healed physically, but there was only one who was saved. There was only one who let Jesus work in him to make him whole, both physically and spiritually as well, because the healing that took place in the Samaritan's life went beyond just the physical. His healing brought faith. His healing brought trust in the one who brings the healing. His healing brought wholeness with his faith in Jesus Christ, who truly makes us well. And this is how we should be thankful. We should be thankful for the one who saves us and who brings healing in our lives. And sometimes that healing that God brings in our life is not always going to be physical. Sometimes it is going to be spiritual. So my grandmother um, passed away when I was in seminary, my last year of Second, my last year of seminary. But before that, she had been in a really terrible car accident. Um, and so for a year and a half, she was just not herself. Now, my grandmother, um, for all it was worth, was not a very kind woman to us grandchildren. She thought that children should be seen and not heard. She thought that um, you know, she had been in a tuberculosis sanatorium when she was a kid, so when we missed our parents, for the, when they were out of, the week, out of town for a weekend, she just thought it was like the dumbest thing for us to cry and be sad when our parents were gone. They're like, she's like, well, they're coming back. It's not that big of a deal. She, again, she loved in the way she had, to, she felt like she needed to be loved, but she was not a very kind lady. But for that last year and a half of her life, she was not herself. She was kind to her great-grandchildren. She loved to watch them play. She was super affectionate to all of us, and she had always had a problem with my mother, and my mother was all of a sudden the light of her life for that last year and a half. So during that last year, I think none of us really knew what to pray for. We're like, well, I don't know what to pray for because grandma's brain is probably never going to get better, but I realized that there is something that's taking place. There's something that's happening. There's something that God is doing in the midst of her life and in our family life that is better, that this horrible thing took place, and yet there's this healing taking place all around us. And so either I'll be, I'm, we're going to be super angry at the guy who ran the, who ran the stop sign and hit her and caused all of this problem, or we're going to be thankful and grateful as a family for the healing that this horrible tragedy took place. See, that horrible thing we ended up being able to be thankful for because God brought wholeness back into our family. God brought relationship back into my dad's family that was broken. And it took us acknowledging that sometimes bad things happen and good things happen as a result. And that we are called to be thankful even in the midst of terrible situations that are happening in our life. And so what if our basic response to God was being thankful for the life that we've been given? Being thankful and showing gratitude for all that we've been given, both the good stuff and the bad stuff. And what if each day we practiced thankfulness. How many hours are we awake during the day? Typically 18 hours during the day. What if each hour during the day we thought of one thing that we could be thankful for in the midst of our lives? That's 18 things that we could be thankful for. It could be 18 of the same things that we're thankful for every, every hour, but, no, but being thankful for the life that we've given, been given no matter what. So Thursday, we, uh, our family ran the turkey trot, and I saw a number of you guys out there while we were running. And uh, I did the 10K, and George did the 5K, and then Will and I, uh, we weren't sure if this was going to happen because he was sick the night before, ended up walking the 5K. 
And as I was running, and as is a typical practice for me when I'm running races, is that I always try to thank the people who are out there. The people, the policemen who are out there making sure that the roads are safe, the volunteers who are out there making sure that people aren't cutting into traffic and that we, they can guide the path the way we want to go. And as I was thanking people, some guy said to me, no, thank you, you're the first person that has thanked us this morning for being out here. And I thought, well, that seems so silly. These people are taking time out of their lives, they're taking time out of their busy schedules, they're taking time out of their Thanksgiving to take care of me while I run, while I do something that's super selfish because I love to run. And so I was just like, maybe we need to be more thankful for the people who are in our lives because maybe people don't know that we are thankful for them. See, we just finished this series about being for Oceanside and about loving our neighbors. So what if that translated into thankfulness for the things that we have, for the blessings that we have? What if we began to actively start thanking those people in our lives? What if we started to thank those people that pack our groceries? Or the woman that we go in her line every time, the woman or man that we go in her line every time and they check our groceries out? Or the person at Starbucks who gives us our coffee or our tea? Or the, per the waiter or waitress that we see every time at that same restaurant? or our garbage person, or our mail person? What if, instead of just assuming that the people who serve us are going to serve us, we were actively thankful for them? We actively shared those words of thankfulness with them. Instead of just expecting a service and expecting to be served because we paid for something, so we should get it, what if we started thinking about those, thanking those who care for us in a genuine way? Because that's what the one man did. He thanked the one who cared for him. He came back to thank Jesus. He was thankful for what he had received. And Jesus, in turn, said, your faith has made you well. Imagine what happened in that man's life after he lived, we don't know what happened, but imagine what happened in his life after he lived out this spirit of thankfulness. What if he became grateful for everything that happened in his life? Because he hadn't expected this healing to take place, but he got it, and he was grateful for it. And what if we began to live out this life of faith and thankfulness what would happen in our lives in return? Our hearts would be changed. The people around us would be changed. Maybe our communities would be changed. Because the Samaritan had it right. Jesus wants to be thankful for every blessing that we, give, that we get each day. And in this season of thankfulness, May we be ever grateful for the many ways our lives have been touched by the grace of God who loves us and heals us and makes us whole. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we are ever thankful for the ways in which you are